Today I'm speaking with Gennady Druzhenko, co-founder and chairman of Pirogov, the first volunteer mobile hospital set up in 2019, and now a crucial player in supporting Ukraine's response to Russian aggression and the casualties that result from it. In civilian life, Gennady is a constitutional scholar focusing on constitutional design and comparative constitutional law with both academic and governmental experience. Now, of course, we'll put some links to his organization. Um, and what we're really going to explore today is how first response uh, medical uh, attention is provided to civilians and military casualties on or near the front lines, which is an incredibly uh, important topic. Um, Gennady, welcome to the channel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear Jonathan. My and pleasure just... to speak to your audience, yeah. Well, it's a great pleasure to have you here. And if anyone's wondering why your English is so good, that is because you did study, I believe, at uh, Aberdeen for a period. Indeed, it was my second LLM. I got in from the University of Aberdeen oh, a lot of years ago. So it was 2008, eight, yeah, 15 years, exactly 15 years ago. I graduated from the University of Aberdeen, and then I spent some time in the United States as a Fulbright scholar. So before the war started in 2014, I used to be like a library guy who far more bookish than practical, but the war changed my life and of whole of my family quite radically. Mm. Uh, but that is very challenging, but great experience, how to provide the direct response to the huge tragedy, huge catastrophe, which experienced it by our people in our country now, right now. So tell me a bit about the first volunteer mobile hospital, because of course the establishment of it predates the full-scale war, uh, but obviously there already was a, a war in the Donbass, there already was a Russian uh, invasion uh, of your country. So for you personally, what were your motivations uh, and when did you your organization first started treating victims of Russian aggression? Uh, oh, yeah. At the first day of the Great War, as I call it, or full-scale invasion is most usual term for, uh, for what we experienced uh, a year and three months now. Uh, it's, we rather revived or renew our activity on the front line because our organization was founded in 2014 but before that it was to like concept it during the revolution of dignity our uprising on maidan where we organized it like improvised it medical teams which treated the wounded and sick protesters from the very first days of this protest it was the idea from my turbulent youth when we experienced it <laughs> a quite turbulent time in the early 18th uh, middle uh, 1980 and then last time in the early 2000 zeros year so that when we talked with my friends or oh, i i remember this day that it was exactly november 30 of 2013 after the ukrainian students was brutally beaten by the riot police without any obvious or even any no cause so we did, uh, it was obvious that the, a lot of people's wood came to the street uh, and we just discussed it how we could be helpful apart from the personal participating and it was a quite a bright idea to try to organize some improvised medical team if some clashes happens. And it was the case from the December the first near the presidential administration, there was first wounded, the first clashes, the first fights again with with the uh, riot police uh, uh, took um, had a play yeah occurred. And uh, it was very first day when I understood why lawyer is uh, helpful for the medics because I never treated the people, but some organization function and some communication with the governmental bodies and particularly with a special security agency which uh, um, responsible for the security of the parliamentary building was really helpful. They allowed us to deploy this improvise it like a medical team in the hall of one of the parliamentary commissions and that helped it not just 
medics to survive because the wave of attacks uh, went forth and back. But as well, um, tens of people which was treated there with first of all with like a, with a special gaze which disturbs the eyes, but then they was heavily beaten. So that, uh, but I was sure that it's just like a moment in my biography, in my destiny that, okay, I helped with the medics a bit. We did very good work. We treated tens of people, but then the first victims was killed on the Maidan on the January. We organized underground hospitals with my friend, which I became met on the first days of the, our revolution or rather uprising against tyranny. And then when we won this uh, fight against tyranny, the Russian invasion started the next day and we started to train young volunteers who are, who was going to the front line, how to provide first medical aid. And finally, when the Ilovais tragedy was the most bloody event of the small war before the full-scale invasion occurred in the lay, uh, last days of the August 2014, the group of people who met on the Mandan and was uh, connected by this medical care uh, gathered it together and we discussed it unacceptable casualties because every third round is died according to the official statistic. Just for, uh, for comp comparison, that the NATO standard 3%, we had 30%, 10 times. And we decided that we should to intervene again in some way. And after the quite prolonged discussion, we decided that we should to try to deliver the qualified medicine with the mobile equipment as uh, close to the front line as possible, but with reasonable risk to the lives of the medics because to prepare the medics that you need long time, long, not like a soldier. And that is was the idea I laid down in the foundation of our first volunteer mobile hospitals. Since then, the first mission, uh, the first hour mission to the Donbass, to the Eastern Front, started in the middle of December 2014. Since then, until the big war, we treated tens of thousands of people, both combatants and civilians, sick and wounded. But then the pandemic started in 2020, something, yeah. Uh, the most of our medics returned back to their usual hospitals because the casualties from the pandemic was far higher than the from de-escalated at that time uh, conflict. But uh, from the very first days of the big scale invasion, we organized it, uh, resurrected like a re re uh, renewed our activity. And when we started from the one ambulance and small company of five guys, and just my wife was a medic among us in the first day of the war. Uh, at the end of Kiev campaign, that is the end of March 2022, we have had more ambulances, well equipped ambulances than any military units which defended the Kiev. And now we are one of the biggest uh, medical units on the front line. We just counted the number of patients which we treated when we renewed statistic in uh, May 2022. So that for whole year from May to 2022 to the April 2023, we created 17,604 patients, not less because sometimes not included in the statistic because of very dramatic circumstances. So that's about uh, 550 people a day. So that is quite a match for a whole year. That's huge. That's a huge uh, achievement. And it's a huge workload as well. And I think what people don't realize, I mean, immediately people think, well, that's fantastic. You must have state support, but actually you don't. You're a voluntary organization that has grown organically through contributions. Um, and you know what is the importance? It, I mean, it seems to be incredibly important, both in Maidan and afterwards, that in Ukraine there are organizations that pop up that see a problem 
And rather than waiting for government to resolve that problem, they try and find a solution. Do you, do you see yourself as part of that flowering of civic society? Oh, yeah, that is quite unusual things for uh, Western, like well-established democracies, because you pay taxes and the government should lead any, especially any war or like a war uh, answer to invasion. But Ukrainian uh, Ukraine is still quite different. Uh, so uh, maybe your audience remember about the term militia, which used in the Second uh, Amendment to the American Constitution. And that is something what is really about Ukrainian volunteers, both armed and uh, armed like we are, because it's not just a government's war or professional war. It's very te technological, but again, at least from Ukrainian part, it's a popular war. So I am deeply believed uh, that if not, if a lot of civilian guys or ununiformed guys in the very uh, very first days and first weeks of the full scale invasion uh, didn't take like um, resistance to the Russian aggression, the outcome would be very different uh, right now. It is really was a great input of the self-organized people, self-organized communities and teams like our one to the our resistance and our success. As I mentioned at the end of the first months of the uh, Russian invasion, uh, our hospital or our team had more ambulances, equipped ambulances that any brigade, military brigade, financed by the budget and supported by our Western allies. Uh, so that that is a, like very uh, one of Ukrainian features. And in other sense, uh, there is no not fashionable to critique uh, the Ukrainian government because Zelensky is like a celebrity and he had. He really deserves this respect from the whole world. But again, uh, we, uh, I saw three times in the government with, uh, under the different presidentships, so I quite well, uh, well aware insider. And still, that is a bureaucratic, that is still corruption in the government. And that is still different motivation. Some people are great and really uh, well educated, uh, well motivated, and patriotic. But not all, but not all, even in within the military and special services. So we just count, try to uh, estimate how, what is the ratio of wounded soldiers and civilians we treated for the last year. At according to the different, uh, according to our analysis, that every at least at least uh, I am stressed at least every tenth of wounded combatants, of uh, soldiers of our defense forces. At the same, or at the different stages of medical treatment was treated by our volunteers medics. We haven't got any scent or any like a realness from Ukrainian or any other government. We just supported by the private sector from the private person with a very modest donation to the some well-known global corporation who decided to support our activity, and we are very thankful. And finally, the very idea of democracy is uh, like some to put some restriction on the government. Unfortunately, that is the natural for the war times that our government is too powerful. But still, we need to compete. We need to demonstrate that uh, another approach is, is possible. I every I like to I love to reiterate that the legendary Heimers, which is legend, uh, like, like a legend in Ukraine now, produced not by the uh, United States government, that is private enterprise, which uh, sponsored by the government, like uh, which sell to the government, but that is still private sector. And so we are not just save a tens of thousands of lives, but we remind about the strength and spirit of free society, which could not just uh, be part of our defenses forces, an effective part, but as well remind to our government that finally government for the people and not the people for the government. 
That's it. And that competition uh, can create, uh, uh, well, space for freedom to to flourish and yeah. to challenge, as you say, bureaucratic behaviours. And what you mentioned here is that potentially thousands of people are alive because of the work you do. Uh, and without that work, there wouldn't have been an alternative. There wouldn't have been some sort of magical solution or a governmental governmental solution. Um, so these people, whether they be civilians, is fantastic. You know, they're they're alive. They're able to contribute to the economy. But crucially, you have saved the lives of thousands of soldiers, and some of those have been able to go back to the front lines and fight again. And I think this is an absolutely crucial area um, to explore further. When I was talking to uh, a military analyst the other day, and I asked a question about uh, ratios of, uh, you know, wounded and killed on the Russian side and the Ukrainian side. And he said, that's the wrong ratio to look at. Well, it's 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 important. But the, he said the real ratio to look at is the survivability. Because if you're wounded on the Russian side, it's a hopeless situation. If you're wounded on the Ukrainian side, then you have a much better chance of surviving. And in some cases, being treated and after several months being returned to the front. So I'd like to get your views on a comparison, this kind of work and survivability that you're bringing to this frontline action compared to what doesn't exist on the Russian side. Well, yeah, you, I am completely agree with this approach that is really the ratio of surveillability is its maybe most important. And really we fight uh, strongly against the death as such. Sometimes our patients experience it up to four stop of the they heart beating. So we almost resurrected them after the uh, death, uh, un untimely death. And it was some very inspiring moments. One of our most heavy patients was the Ukrainian soldiers. And when we finally won our fight against he, against death, he opened the eyes, uh, and when he his mind became clear, he said, "Oh, it seems my birthday today." And it was his exactly birthday. But now he celebrate twice because his uh, heart stopped four times during our uh, medical evacuation. And that is great inspiration, especially for me, because I, as I mentioned, I am not a medic. My wife is a medic and lead our medical team on the front line. But for me, I really miss the books, miss the university discussion, miss the intelligent public, which uh, focused on the good universities. But then when you understand that when you like heard about the moments like this, you hugely satisfied and you believe that really that maybe is one of the best things you could do because finally he's somebody's son somebody's husband and maybe somebody's father and all this small universe maybe and not maybe for certain they would be glad because they go to the hospitals not to the chemistry for uh, his father son and uh, husband so uh, we experience it at least hundreds of such a situation. Once we, uh, last year, we evacuated the small uh, eight-year girl from the Donbass to the Dnieper at about tw uh, 200 miles. She was heavy wounded because the Russian rockets uh, exploded in the uh, village yard when she played with her uh, sister and two guys, neighbor guys. Unfortunately, neighbor guys died uh, immediately and her sister a bit later but this girl uh, we, it was very, one of the most difficult evacuation because she was small not like a big man and when we delivered her alive to the big hospitals in Dnipro uh, our medics one of them by the way returned from the Germany to help Ukraine he's Ukrainian originally but work as an anesthesiologist in Germany and they got SMS from the medics from the big hospital. You made a miracle. According to the, all this, our data, she didn't survive, but she did. And um, that's 
demonstration of our approach. We really, uh, for us, uh, the human life matters and matters. Uh, that is the best, biggest value in our um, worldview. The second part, I strongly believe, and now we almost achieve this level of the state of art equipment and good ambulances sent to people from throughout the world who support us. And uh, our now equipment uh, is far more better again than in most units of the armed forces Ukrainian, but for sure than the Russian when we do was a part of deliberation forces which deliberated Kharkiv region that's in the north northwest. We saw that it was like a medical museum. We saw that like some production from the Soviet time. Uh, I remember I am old enough that <laughs> and that was ah come on guys we st you still use this outdated that is like a dinosaurs <laughs> medical equipment. And that, that is really not like a different approach between Ukrainians and especially our units and some other and the Russian. But that is about very substance of our war. For sure it is for territory. We need to liberate occupied territory. It is for Ukrainian identity, the right to determine our future, but as well for the very fundamental uh, values that is and within the the a man a human being stand in the center of ukrainian universe and for russians that's for sure statehood the statehood which could sacrifice as much lives as they want millions of lives like it was in the world war ii uh, and i'm really glad that our values are not just some declaration but they demonstrated every day on the battlefield we really i remain you know that uh during world war ii the zhukov that one of the stalin's marshals said notorious phrase the russian women born far more like a soldier so don't care about their lives but i uh, reiterate again and again to my people you shouldn't follow that Zhukov's approach, but you should remain uh, this great movie, American movie, Save the uh, Ryan. Saving Private Ryan, yeah. Private Ryan, yeah, Private Ryan. So that, and we try to follow and follow quite successfully this human centric approach. And of course, that's been quite important, hasn't it? Because when you combine that human centric approach and you combine it with satellite communications and drones and precision artillery and of course the nato techniques which over the last sort of two decades um a lot of training's been done on those with ukrainian armed forces when you combine the sanctity of life with advanced techniques and weaponry that seems to be having a strong result in terms of first survival and then being able to push russia back towards its borders uh, I completely agree because uh, Ukrainian soldiers believe that Ukrainian Ukrainians and the Ukrainian government and Ukrainian people really care about they and if they would be wounded, they uh, get uh, a best medical care possible, at least in the circumstances done. And that really inspired Ukrainian uh people, Ukrainian forces, Ukrainian soldiers to fight uh, bravely and effectively because uh, uh, because it is an unparalleled sense of solidarity between uh, Ukrainian people and Ukrainian defense forces, which is really very wide uh, terms. It is not just the uniformed people, but a lot of supporting units like our ones. So uh, it is some. Sometimes I even cry when the people try to present us small gifts or provide with some cakes or deliver some uniform or things like that. Sometimes I never experience it uh, quickness like that. Sometimes we need one more or uh, a couple of a couple of more like this Starlink satellite internet provider. 
and you just post on Facebook and during one week, uh, not longer, somebody call you say, we have two or even three we could uh, present to you, not to sell you, but really give to you. And that is maybe formula of our success. Uh, nobody or as a few uh, expect uh, at the beginning of this full scale invasion. Sometimes I even joked that I was born and even graduated from school during the Soviet time. And you know, the motto of Soviet time was communist, communist, communist. And when people just live without money and something like that, utopia. But once I experienced it, in the, especially in the first months of the Kiev, we got tons of resources without paying, paying for nothing. People really thought that we one of the first well-organized uh, team, which we provide a lot of uh, medical care for everybody who need, and we was quite well known at the time. And then just sometimes we need begging them, stop to supply us with the tons of <laughs> plaster, for example. Uh, but that is the case. That is really very interesting and unusual experience when people so eager to survive as a nation that they put all energy, almost sources, even their lives, risking their lives to to win. And finally, we win. Uh, instead of a very different expectation, not just from Russian, okay, Russian, but from our real friends and alliance the West, that was going to be my next question because it's Ukrainian bravery and it's Ukrainian skin that's that's in the game here. But you do have partners, both your organization and, of course, the, the military in the wider sense has a lot of foreign partners. So I'd love to know how those kind of partnerships have assisted you in your work and what kind of organizations uh, have reached out to kind of help uh, you expand uh, the work you're doing. Yeah, good question. That is finally we, in fact, award our place within the defense forces. Finally, uh, a year ago, I sent the letter to Commander in Chief uh, General Zaluzhny, one of the legend of this war, like a uh, uh, Ukrainian as an hour, <laughs> and uh, he uh, just resoluted on the, my my uh, letter that uh, agree and just include the first volunteer mobile hospital to the defense forces of Ukraine. Since then, we do not experience any like resistance from the both uh, government and military bureaucracy, which it was uh, a bit the case in some times. But again, that is, uh, we demonstrated our effectiveness and our very high standards on the battlefields and uh, more and more military units approach it to us and ask us to help on the some stage. In the some stages of medical evacuation, we now just one remark, we do just pre-hospital medical treatment. That is uh, extraction from the battlefield, mostly on the special or armored car like a Humvee or Pinsgauers. Then we work shoulder to shoulder on the stabilization point or, or the forward uh, surgical teams, which is known in the NATO's uh, terms, uh, with, with the military doctors. We work on number of them. And then we have a, like a very, our feature is uranium wheels, very well equipped uranium wheels with ventilators, defibrillators, and other sophisticated equipment on which we evacuate heavy wounded from the stabilization points to the rare hospitals. So that um, uh, when the people, that is like a front line, everybody wants to survive. And uh, people just uh, speak about, about us and uh, commanders or medical commanders from different units call us or visited us and discuss it about our cooperation. Nobody commanded to have uh, to, to just cooperate or collaborate with us. But as more we well known, thanks to our effectiveness and profession, uh, professionality, uh, 
the more military want to work with us. So if we treated about up to 500 uh, uh, patients last summer, now uh, last three summer, we treated more than 2,500. So five times. And that is, uh, from one on one hand, that is undiscussable success and recognition. But on the other hand, that is a, our uh, need and resources just rocketed. Because even if you work with the volunteers medics, they're brave, they're very motivated, they're very bright guys. But again, the medicine is a quite expensive venture. <laughs> Absolutely. And these stabilization points, they're still, you know, you're getting people away from the, uh, you know, the immediacy of, uh, you know, um, being under fire, but you're still in a dangerous place. Um, have, uh, I, I want to ask two questions. I mean, one is, have any of your volunteers and medics actually sort of suffered or um, given their lives um, in this process? But the other one, of course, is, this is a critical moment. You're not evacuating people a long way away. You're getting them just far enough away so you can stabilize them. What is the improvement in survivability rate by taking this approach, this very sort of approach that focuses on treating people as close to the front lines as possible, doing some fairly complex uh, medical procedures, which normally would have to wait until you get them back to, uh, you know, to a much larger base? Okay. Uh, the first question, that is one of my proud and really I keep my finger crossed and pray every day. We are still haven't lost any of our volunteers for eight year plus. And that is, again, just stress our approach that people care and care uh, matters and matters most in our, in our business, to say, in our activity. Uh, so, but we are really, that is really scary and uh, uh, not safe. For example, on January 16th, the uh, Russian missiles destroyed the building just across the road uh, of the hospital in Chasivyar, that is a small town near the Bakhmut, when we live more than half a year in 2010. The windows just was broken, and even the door uh, in the uh, um, in the rooms uh, was broken by this uh, explosion wave. So that um, some of our embassies got under the like uh, artillery uh, fire. Uh, some that it was during the Kiev campaign under the, still have a signs of bullets. But thankfully, again, all our peers survive. Unfortunately, some of them died when they returned to 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 their homes because freedom is not free. Even if you do, do not kill by the bullet, sometimes your heart is just by stroke. Yeah. Uh, the second question. Uh, so we, we risk our lives, but again, we do our best to not take unreasonable risk because the war that is about risking your life and sometimes we are we are quite clearly understand and prepare our people that unfortunately we couldn't guarantee 100 percent safety because it is not about war uh the second question is really that is from ukrainian experience of the years of war uh why we so um, actively use and organize uh, we call them stabilization points because we couldn't say uh, send helicopters to the front line so that is usual uh, golden hour for the western and NATO uh, armies uh, when the soldier is wounded she has just treated a bit by their comrades and then the helicopter should came and evacuate him in the big rare hospitals. But unfortunately, uh, helicopters couldn't fly in this uh, frontline zone, just a uh, fighting jet, which is under the huge risk there. And so that uh, all evacuation made by vehicles, extraction vehicles, sometimes they are 
special medical vehicles, but sometimes just usual like pickups or armored vehicles, fighting armored vehicles. And so that was, to my mind, that very wise decision to organize a 10, 15 kilometers or 20 kilometers from the battlefields, so-called stabilization points. There is not huge surgery there. That the uh, principal aim to stabilize the patients, to stop blooding, to provide with some mm, uh, to, 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 to treat that's unusual ache when that, for example, uh, traumatic amputation of the legs or arms. And then prepare for the medical evacuation in the uh, within the, this uh, speci specific ambulances, which called reanimobiles, which uh, equipped with ventilators like defibrillators. And that is, uh, um, and then in the rare hospitals, but rare that comparatively rare. We most of our uh, evacuation done to the crematories, Slavians, Ruskiv, that is. 25 kilometers from the Bahamas, 30 kilometers from the Bahamas. But that is big, well-equipped hospitals because it's a big cities on the hundreds of thousands of people lived there before the war. So that uh, um, these different stages of evacuation, short, in fact, stages, that is something that we learned from the, our years and uh, years of this brutal war with the Russians. And to... I strongly believe that they prove themselves, turn it out to be quite successful scheme of medical treatment on the pre-hospital stage. And of course, even when people are in these larger hospitals, they're not fully out of danger because Russia's strategy has been to clearly target civilian infrastructure, cultural infrastructure, but it has also targeted you know, trauma points, hospitals, quite deliberately it seems as well um now there's much better sort of air air coverage but it's it's not a zero risk process is it recovering in a ukrainian hospital you are right unfortunately and that is quite one of the features of this war if you have a red cross on your uh, car or on the um, premises that is rather targets and protection so Russian understand that to kill medics that is uh, really cause some huge set and decrease um, effectiveness of medical care. So for them, really uh, ambulances. I know a lot of stories when they just uh, fire it as an ambulance. It unfortunately sometimes successfully. And again, the big hospitals, which is open on the Google Maps, it is not a secret. Uh, sometimes it is targets for the uh, missiles and artillery attacks. As I mentioned, we personally experienced it twice in our last year's history. That first was bombing uh, near the Bakhmut, uh, like a city hospital, when we stay first and then we spent a month before retreating to the chassis we are, and then the first missile strike and then like a artillery strike <laughs> targeted in the chassis VR hospital, which is the only hospital in this small town. So that that is the true. And even in Kramatorsk and Slovyansk, which is now the uh, first full treatment uh, provided for the most of Ukrainian wounded soldiers, that is still under the dangerous of the missile attacks. It is unreachable for artillery, but still reachable for the Russian like a short range missiles. And th that is that is the case and that is the danger, but again, the flow of the casualties is quite considerable. Sometimes really work or stop 724. That it is the only possible uh, way to disseminate wounded and uh, injured between this Hospitals, because you know the ge geographic situation in, is such that between the Donbass agglomeration now went full of Ukrainian forces and Dnipro, the next largest city with a good uh, medical infrastructure that more than about two, 
2,000 miles, so it's quite considerable way. So when the first, re first serious, uh, like a hospital treatment done, pump heavy round it, uh, evacuate it to the Dnipro, but you need to provide or make a surgery, to, uh, in, especially in difficult uh, cases as soon as possible. So that is the case. There is a still danger, but we hedge it in in the way possible uh, in the circumstances done. <laughs> and of course, the um, spring offensive that's long been talked about, uh, I'm obviously not going to ask about any details of the offensive itself, but over the next couple of months, as Russia progressively is pushed out of uh, territory it's held, which I you know I believe is is absolutely possible, there of course is a risk of um, you know greater casualties and that the rate of casualty increasing. Um, are you confident that the infrastructure is in place to to deal with those casualties, or is it going to be quite a strain? Unfortunately, you are ready. We was part of our uh, liberation counteroffensive on the Kharkiv uh, direction, and even though it was one of the most successful counteroffensives in the recent history, not just in Ukraine, it is still was as a number of casualties rocketed because we personally deployed like improvised uh, forward surgical team in the sun farm near the front line. And when the counteroffensive started, we created tens and tens of people during one day. So, and uh, another feature, if as a lot of experts predicts, the counteroffensive starts on the south of Ukraine, unlike the east of Ukraine where we are now, it is not so populated by big city and uh, like a urban agglomeration. So that it's villages, villages rather, country landscape. So it is far less uh, well-equipped medical facilities. But I couldn't speak for whole Ukrainian health system because we have a minister of health care, we have commander of the medical forces, but we, again, we as a first volunteer mobile hospitals mm -hmm. do our best. We even bought a motor home, by the way, from Britain and uh, equip it like a like a motor home for our medical team but because we know when we go to just liberated territories sometimes uh, nowhere to live almost all buildings are damaged in uh, there is no pure water there is no heat and there is no electricity we work in the limans it is liberated uh, city uh, about half a year but it's still very heavy damage so that uh, and we prepare some um, like a uh, movable or uh, yeah movable uh, vehicle when we could provide at this fast medical aid for wounded guys so i hope our experience our some sources we which, which we guys read from throughout the world for the last year on last year and some three months now, really help us. But again, you're right that the counteroffensive is always bloody. Unfortunately, we are not suppress Russian in the air. They still prevail us uh, in the in the air with their air forces, and still they quite well prepare it. Uh, to to the best of my knowledge, I am not a military spy, but again. We speak a lot with our patients, with soldiers. They're well, quite well prepared to the our offensive, uh, especially on the south. That's that's why the last days, like the surprise Ukrainian counter small counteroffensive in the Bakhmut, is comparatively successful because they wait on the south and not where they concentrated all the best uh, military units. But again, I'd hope in our in military commander, because some of them, are, some of our generals, including Zeluzhny, I know quite personally, as a really good strategist and care about people. I hope we could repeat our success on the Kharkiv 
uh, region and as well as Kherson liberation. And for sure, we keep our finger crossed and hope for the successful deoccupation of our temporary occupied territories. At least we are ready to do our best and treat hundred and even more like, uh, soldiers uh, a day. And at the end of you, I'd obviously like you to say how people who are interested in helping, how they can do that. But I've got one more question before uh, before we get to that. And of course, we've talked about physical trauma. We've talked about treating sort of wounds, whether they be sort of, you know, relatively light or incredibly serious. Um, but when this is all over, there is also going to be a huge amount of mental trauma. Um, do you think a lot more work needs to be done to prepare uh, the country to treat both the civilian and the military uh, mental trauma um, that is going to remain uh, even after victory. This is a very good and very urgent point because for sure tens of thousands are already physically wounded and invalidated, but uh, psychologically uh, that is, I believe, hundreds of thousands, because it is really very intensive and very brutal war. So uh, that is, we started, apart from our frontline activity, a couple of months ago, thanks to the g generous grant from the Pfizer, we started to build up our own rehabilitation center. We really enjoy the, one of the biggest asset we enjoy trust of the military people because people war people do not speak to everybody about their problem and they like ache they pain so we started and hope if we find some other uh, partners or donors to open the door until the end of this year that is very picture square place in the forest in the south of Kyiv region, so about one mile, 100 miles from the Kyiv to south. And that is really was like a miracle. At the same day, one Ukrainian businessman gifted us a plot of land with some uh, unfinished building, and we got the grant from the Pfizer, which we worked for half a year to, to, get, to, to get it. So it is enough to, to start our uh, adventure. <laughs> A rehabilitation project, but we still need more. If anybody interested in that, I would be more than pleased to be in contact and discuss to possible cooperation. But again, you are right. We, on the front line, we see the small sources of this, both mental and physical wounded. But I could just imagine huge river which we joined and became on the again and again. And every day we treat, as I mentioned, up to 100 wounded people just on the Donbass. Most intensive, but still about 100 miles uh, front line from the thousands of kilometers. And that is, that, that is uh, urge, already urgent need of Ukraine should be discussed and should be discussed uh, both within the Ukrainian society because mentally this war is very difficult and challenging. I could um, I could see even in my people who are not in trenches but under huge mental pressure. But as well as our Western partners, how to return this hundred of thousand uh, Ukrainian soldiers and warriors to the far more sophisticated, far more complicated and far more nuanced, peaceful life. Because frontline is dangerous, but black and white. You kill or you are killed. But that is not the formula for the peaceful life. And again, that is a good question. And I believe that is the next challenge for Ukraine after our, when we survived and regained our territories. Now, we're going to put links to your organization in this video, of course, and I strongly encourage people to check that out and the links and to reach out to you on how they can help. Um, but apart from donations, uh, what other ways are there in which people watching this in the US, Canada, Britain, Germany, Australia and the Nordics, um, which a lot of our audience comes from, how can they actually reach out to you and, and help? 
Yeah, all our contacts on our website, which is bilingual, Ukrainian and English. So you are more than welcome to reach us by uh, social networks or the telephone number, which we provided on our website or email, who, whatever uh, everybody prefer. But again, you could help for sure to treat uh, thousands of people monthly. We need money just to fuel the tanks of our ambulances, to repair that, to buy some medicine, uh, to buy sophisticated equipment. And now that uh, we need about $100,000 a year a month to maintain our activity. As I mentioned, we have another ambitious project, which is quite different to build up our own uh, rehabilitation center in the Kiev region. Uh, and as well, but you can help by providing us with the best practices, with some uh, state-of-art equipment, for example, like a ventilators Hamilton T1 with the use by Swiss Army, and I believe Ukrainian various deserve that state-of-art uh, uh, urgent medicine equipment. But as well, as well, if you're a journalist or popular blogger, you're welcome. We could, uh, you could live for a while with us. It is comparatively safe. Uh, and just experience from the inside our activity and just uh, spare the word uh, among the people. As well, every idea is appreciated because, again, we are brave enough to meet challenge from one of the biggest and brutal army in the world but as well i'm sober enough uh, that we need that without western help without help from the people for whom democracy freedom liberty human dignity matters we couldn't survive uh, we experienced twice in the 20th century very brave resistant to the russian hordes but twice we lost because the geopolitical circumstances was different or rather opposite to the modern so i ask you in back to find a way to reach us and if you consider how to support this fight for liberty for dignity for humanity we are one of the best possible beneficiary because as i like to reiterate our brave soldiers fight against russians who brought to our land uh, ruins and deaths but we are volunteers medics fight against death as such and that is maybe one of the most novel and most human things to help people to survive tens and now tens of thousands of people so but again we appreciate even the warm word which you sent us and say, guys, you are great. We are with you. <laughs> I mean, it's and, incredible and, work. Yeah. yeah, every support and every donation and uh, really appreciate it. We really need it. Just imagine that uh, the second year in a row, I'm not a very young guy, uh, but I... Uh, uh, went from our home my wife spent more time on the front line i looking for the sources most of my time and again uh, we sacrifice our time energy health but we could allow to uh to save thousands of life because somebody support us and that is the formula of our victory victory of a uh, civilized civilized world and humans it's incredible work you're doing and i'm so glad um that we're able to you know introduce that to at least my audience and hopefully that will also lead you know to other people sharing this around amongst their uh networks uh and hopefully some journalists amongst them too um but Gennady, thank you so much for for your time and the incredible work you're doing um and i really hope victory comes soon uh and uh, you're able to carry on doing the incredible work you're doing to save lives. And uh, Slava Ukrainian. Here I am, Slava. Oh, my dog came to me. I say, I want to go to... <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for this interview.